Hello, everybody. Welcome back to True Gospel Radio. Uh, this is your host once again, Brother Dakota. We've got Brother Matthew on the show today. And uh, we're going to talk about a few different things. Um, we talked about how we want to discuss um, the situation going on with the um, Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. Uh, now they just renamed it a few days ago. Uh, C-H-O-P, CHOP, uh, Capitol Hill Occupied Protest. Um, so we're going to talk about that. And then after we touch on that, we're going to talk about uh, the state of the church right now, especially in America, how the church is uh, very lukewarm and uh, there's not very much courage among believers in America as far as, you know, stepping out and, and, uh, you know, preaching the gospel, and uh, the Bible says in Daniel chapter 11, though, that those who know God will be strong and do exploits, so anyways, we'll get into that later on, so uh, why don't you introduce yourself, uh, Brother Matthew? Yeah, my name is Brother Matthew. Um, I'm a minister here with the Grace Team in Seattle. Uh, we are a full gospel street preaching group. And we uh, have uh, recently been going into the Chaz, the um, Chaz Chop, whatever you want to call it, uh, occupied zone. And, uh, you know, Dakota and I have been working together here with the Grace team for a few months now. We've got other brothers on board, and this is a, a trying time in our country. Uh, we're going through uh, economic, um, you know, oppression with the COVID-19 racial tensions um the political climate is tense right now um but really the weakest thing of all the weakest problem of all is the state of our church it has no courage it has no desire there's no fire in the church it's gone out the the lamp in the temple has gone out in the american church and it's been out for years but we're now seeing the result of it being out. See, um, you know, we, we're able to get by with just lukewarm Christianity until things like this start happening. You know, people are con content to live without a spiritually healthy church until we start seeing the breakdown of society. And that is what we're seeing right now with the chop chaz zone is the complete breakdown of civil society. Um, you know, I we've recently gone into this zone many times now, and I can tell you from personal experience going in and preaching to these people firsthand, um, it's like the Lost Boys from Peter Pan. These people have no direction. Uh, they don't know where they're going. They're not there. They weren't raised in the church, many of them. Um, many of them have never heard the gospel. Um, they're not reading their Bibles. And you know who's at fault for that? The church. Because the church has lost the vision. The church has lost the fire. The, the church has lost the drive to get out and make things happen. You know, we read about Wesley. We read about Fox. We read about these men. Okay? They turn the world upside down. They didn't wait for things to happen. They went and made it happen through the Spirit. If we read examples of Samson, I read about Samson. Every time I read about Samson, I just get fired up because he was a true man of God. And he fought the Philistines. He didn't wait for them just to invade. He fought them. You know, we, we read about David and his zeal against Goliath. He didn't, he didn't tuck tail and run. Folks, we are not in that time right now. It's not time to run. It's time to fight. And so yeah, I'm 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 built up. I'm I'm worked up over this whole thing that's happening in Seattle. I'm upset about it. Um, there's a kind of a baptism of of holy anger over what's happening in our society right now. And a lot of people say I'm an angry preacher. I'm not angry at all. I'm I'm very caring. I'm very loving. I I want to see people saved. I want to see true fruit. But I'm upset with what I'm seeing in the church and in the world. This is the conditions 
the conditions have caused what's happening right now. The moral decay is the cause of the breakdown in our society right now. It's complete moral decay. So that's just my introduction. Um, you know, just folks, we gotta get, we, we gotta wake up. We gotta wake up. Um, we're asleep. You know, Leonard Ravenel used to use this saying, a man who is painting his porch while his house is on fire would be considered an idiot. <laughs> it, it, but that's exactly what's happening with our church. We're painting the porch while the house is on fire. Another thing that, that Ravenhill said that the church is doing is, you know, Ravenhill said that a man would be an idiot to go and buy uh, fishing gear and go and fish in his bathtub. But that's what the church is doing as far as evangelism goes. You know, yep. they're just pastors are just fishing with the same people every week and getting little to no fruit. You know, the, the, the church is 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 shrinking in size in America. Churches are closing down, yep. you know, by the multitudes instead of the church growing and making disciples and and getting more people saved. You know, we're seeing more people fall away from the faith. Yep. Yeah, it's, and, it's, it's yeah. sad to see it. We're seeing the breakdown of it right now. Mm -hmm. But what, one of the things that I thought of um, with all that, that you just said is, um, you know, we see this pattern uh, whenever you study revival history. We see the pattern that you're talking about where it people are so apathetic that it's not until um, things get really, really bad that people actually start to get serious about seeking God again and praying and mm -hmm. evangelizing and, and working towards revival. And so I think that this is a time now when, when it's getting bad enough where more Christians are going to start, um, you know, seeing how serious of, of times that we're in and they're going to start praying more and, and doing more for the Lord. Um, and also, um, you know, you talked about how we need to be on the the aggressive uh, side of things instead of just, you know, sitting around and, and just waiting. We're too passive. For We're too passive. Yeah. yeah, and William Booth, you know, he said, uh, he said, I'm not waiting for a move of God. I am a move of God because yes. God doesn't just do everything for us. He doesn't just you know, send revival down from heaven without us doing anything. You know, he, he waits on us to move, but right. yet everybody today thinks that they just need to sit in church and do nothing and wait for God to move. Yeah. I mean, that's the problem is just the static, it is the static nature of the church. You know, the, the, the first century church on the day of Pentecost, where were they on the day of Pentecost? They were in the upper room agonizing in prayer. Uh, what is the church doing now? They're organizing functions, they have committees, they've got potlucks, they're not in prayer. There's no real time with God. I mean, church, churches don't even have prayer meetings anymore. Mm -hmm. Are we gonna go to a church that doesn't even have a prayer meeting for crying out loud? I'm just gonna stay home and pray. Yeah. I mean, if a church doesn't have a prayer meeting, it's, it doesn't have any life. There's, no, there's, no, there's nothing in it, it has no air. You know, right now, the church can say this, I cannot breathe. The church cannot breathe right now. You know, they want to have this Black Lives Matter movement going out saying, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Look, they've got some valid points. There's some racial problems. Uh, there's, there, are, there is police brutality. But the deeper problem is the lostness of men, the darkness of men's hearts. And I'll tell you what happened. We went into Chaz. We cried out. Like Jonah cried out when he went into Nineveh. He went out and, and cried mightily into that city that they would repent of their sins. He didn't go to pat them on the back. I mean, he didn't even want to do it. It wasn't like Jonah was gearing up for this message. It, it wasn't something he wanted to do. In fact, he, of course, we know the story. You know, he got swallowed by the great fish, and finally he had to go. He got the message. And that's what we did. We went and cried mightily into that place. And, you know, they did not receive it. I mean, they ended up choking me and attacking me 
And, um, and then yesterday when we went out there, this is just yesterday, uh, the 20th of, of June, the guy hit me, pepper sprayed me. Um, they, they locked me down. They, they tried to put me in a car and kidnap me, brother. Yeah, I know. I've... They tried to put me in a car, an organ-plated car, and to kidnap me. I mean, this is what we're dealing with. This is not, this is not Plato. These people are out to kill. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is the hour that we are living in. When Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said, you know, you understand, or he said to all the people, he said, you understand the face of the sky. You can see the sky when it's red, you know, tomorrow it'll be fair weather and back and forth, but you don't understand this time. You don't understand the times. And that's it. That's my message to the church. You don't understand the times we're living in. I'm speaking to the religious people. You don't understand the times that we're living in because you're not seeing it. You're concealed behind your little four walls of your church and you're not seeing the big picture here. You know, Wesley used to say, the world is my sanctuary. The world is my sanctuary. Okay. The word of God is not bound. Like Paul said in, in Second Thessalonians, I believe he said, the word of God is not bound. We're not going to keep it bound behind some pulpit, some dead minister in some church somewhere, collecting thousands of dollars a month in tithe. I'm done with it. We're going to go to the lost like William Booth. Because that's what this nation needs. We need, a, we need a revival of the lostness of men. We need an understanding of the lostness of men and the courage to cry to them in this last day. If there's one thing we need, we need a revelation. Let me say that one more time. We need a revelation of the lostness of man and the courage to cry out to them the message of salvation. And if people see that, they're going to be inspired because there's nothing in church right now that inspires people. Nothing. I'm not inspired. I'm not inspired by it, their messages. No. Oh, we're having this here. Here's the program. Read it. It's like, you know, we come down, we, we come in at nine, we leave at 10. We, 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 ha we expect the Holy Spirit to do everything he's going to do in 45 minutes to an hour, and we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm. We got to get on God's schedule, brother. Yeah, and you know, the, the sad thing is that I've noticed is that uh, not only, like you said, our, our pastors, you know, they, they don't have the, the fire of God. They don't have that passion for, for lost souls. They, you know, they don't, they don't even have a vision for, for reaching the loss in their community. And uh, it, it really blew my mind the other day when I was at a, uh, a church function. I actually read, uh, this was in a, a certain uh, very popular denomination that's worldwide. I won't say which denomination it is, but uh, they said in their, in their um, mission statement or their, their doctrinal statement or whatever you call it for their whole denomination, one of their rules was they were against uh, fanaticism. Basically, hmm. fanaticism. they're, they're right. against people that are on fire for God and are fanatical because yeah. it's somehow embarrassing or it's just too hardcore. I don't know, but preachers these days, they're like, they're like either businessmen or comedians or public speakers, but they're not really yeah. preachers of the gospel. Well, let me say this, brother. Again, I'm quoting because it's not an original statement. Preaching is not a profession. If anybody goes into preaching make, to, to make it a profession, then they are fake, to put it lightly. Because preaching is not a profession. It's a passion of God that burns in the heart that does not go out until the day you die. Preachers do not retire. Okay, mm -hmm. they don't retire because the, if you're retiring, you're telling me that the fire of God has gone out. Okay, what did Jeremiah say? He said, I would not, I would not cease, I would, I would cease to speak in his name. I said, I will speak no more in his name. Okay, Jeremiah 20, I forget the exact verse. I will speak no more in his name. 
He said, but I couldn't because his word was like a fire in my bones. It was shut up in my bones and I could not forbear. And that's what it is. A true preacher cannot help but preach. He cannot help it. He can't stop it. Any more than the water cannot stop flowing down a stream. A preacher cannot stop preaching. You might as well tell him to stop breathing. It's not going to happen. So when people come up to us and try to correct us and try to tell us to stop preaching and you're being too loud and you're disrupting people and you're doing this and you're doing that, I have a message for them. I'm not going to stop breathing and I'm not going to stop preaching because I can't. It's God burning in me a desire to see the soul saved, especially in that chop chaz region or wherever in Seattle, God's put it on, God's put it in our vision to go into Seattle, to cry mightily, under, you know, for souls to preach the cross. Okay. So don't cry to come us, come at us and try to tell us to stop. Cause it's just a waste of time. Exactly. We're never going to listen. I'm not going to listen to that. Yeah. Let's tell and, God to tell us to stop. Mm -hmm. See what he says. Yeah. And, and uh, that's what the Bible says. You know, Jesus told us in, in Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Um, and he also said in, uh, most people don't know this, but you know, the, the great commission is stated a little bit differently in Luke. In the Gospel of Luke, it says, um, it's Jesus said that repentance or the remission or forgiveness of sins mm -hmm. should be preached in all nations in my name, beginning at Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So what that's saying is not only we need to preach the gospel out loud in the open air, because that's the, you know, the Greek word caruso, it means to be a public crier, means yes. to be a public preacher, but also you know, Jesus said, you, you need to preach repentance for the, the remission of sin. So you, people need to understand uh, that they have to repent of their sins in order for their sins to be forgiven. Um, yeah, repentance is a foundational stone. It's a foundational mm -hmm. stone. We, we're, the problem is we're jumping to verse 20 when we haven't gotten through verse 2. You know, Jesus said, you know, he that bids you to go a mile, go with him too. Well, we've got to walk the first mile before we can walk the second here. Okay. We're getting into things that are too spiritually deep that people don't understand. People want to talk about the manifestations. They want to talk about the miracles. They want to talk about all these, these prophecies. Folks, we've got to, the, the church has got to repent first. Yeah. We're not going to see manifestations of the spirit until people are repenting of their sin for crying out loud. Their sins are crying mightily to heaven and God's looking at their sin and saying, I, I detest this. I can't, I can't stand your solemn meetings. They're an offense unto me. This whole congregation, your hands are stained with blood. I mean, the church has got blood on its hands. If, if the church is not standing against abortion, or, or their politics aren't against abortion. They got blood on their hands for crying out loud. So look, I mean, we want to jump to, to mile two, mile, mile three, mile 10, when we haven't got through mile one. And that is we've got to repent and believe the gospel and turn from our sin. And the sin yeah. in the church. Okay, judgment must begin at the house of God. So sin, I mean, look, people get upset with us because we're crying about sin. But that's the, that's the fundamental issue that is yeah. plaguing the church. It's the fundamental issue that's plaguing the world. You cannot preach without talking about sin. You can just forget it. The wages of sin is death. I mean, the whole, mm -hmm. the whole reason, reason for Christ's coming into the world is to save his people from their sins. That's one of the yeah. first prophecies in Matthew, or in, the, in the Gospels. Jesus came yeah. to save his people from their sins. Not from being poor, okay? Mm -hmm. Not from not having enough money. Not from not seeing enough miracles. Not to get their leg healed, okay? It's to save his people from their sins. So, you know, don't tell the preacher to stop preaching against sin because that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's a foundational issue that we need to cry out against. 
but we also need to preach right. the cross. We need to preach forgiveness, you know, and the grace of God, which leads men to repentance, the goodness of God. But yeah, that's, that's what's plaguing us right now. Yeah. And I think that's why um, the church is in such a lukewarm state is because we haven't, we, we've skipped most of the church has skipped that first fundamental foundational thing. That's until a person has repent, truly repented of their sins, they haven't even been born again and entered into the well, kingdom. They're not even born again. As in, in, in Hebrews 6, 1, you know, let, let us go on under, unto perfection, unto the, the deeper things of God that talks about in verse 2, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and a faith toward God. That's the foundation. And, um, you know, back like in the, um, the early Methodist movement with John Wesley, the reason, one of the reasons why, why it was such a powerful movement is because they made sure that everyone who came into their church um, with all the churches that they, they planted all over the place, their, you know, their mm -hmm. movement uh, grew into a really big movement tons of souls got saved, you know, thousands, I think even hundreds of thousands of, of people got saved. But the reason that the church was so on fire and so effective is because anybody that didn't truly repent of all their sins, they would, they would kick them out of the church. They wouldn't let them be a member of the church. You know, they would have uh, class meetings where they would get together and anybody that had any sin that they were struggling with in their life, they would talk about it and and uh, share those things. And as a body, you know, they would help people overcome their sin. Just like it says in uh, 1 John 1, 7, you know, it says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ uh, cleanses us from all sin. And so because pastors these days, they don't have the backbone to preach against sin. And to rebuke and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, we've allowed so much sin to come into the church, and I think that's one of the big reasons why it's so lukewarm. Yeah, I, when you allow that, when you allow that level of the flesh to come into the church and to take foothold and to begin to s deceive people, and and people see that there's no consequence for that sin. And that's why Paul said, if any man be a brother, if you call any man a brother and he's a fornicator or an idolater or covetous, you're not even supposed to eat with him. You're not supposed to have fellowship with him. We're holding hands with the world here and we're expecting that we're all going to go in the right direction. The world has much more influence over the church than the church has over the world right now. Mm -hmm. It's not supposed to be that way, but that's what's happened. Yeah. And so... People get upset with us when we go into these places like Chop or Chaz, you know, which is, you know, a, a microcosm of basically what it would look like without police or without laws or um, in a, in a quote unquote idealistic society, you know, where people can set up their own little, you know, societies of how they think world should be lived or life should be lived. Um, we go into these places and we cry out the message of the gospel. It pierces the heart like a sword. Okay, we're, we're, we're shooting out arrows and swords because it's piercing down into their souls because it's having an effect on them. Many of them have not heard the true gospel before. They've been to churches that have preached dead messages to dead people, but they've never actually felt the actual conviction of the holy spirit before so when you go in to actually preach with the fire of god and you're under the anointing of the holy spirit the arrows of god the, the arrows of god's word will pierce the heart a sword will pierce through your heart and you will feel convicted and you will do one of two things you'll either get super angry super violent and super mad like we've been seeing or you will repent we're not seeing the repentance, we're seeing the anger, and we're seeing the violence. But you know what? All the early apostles saw it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Paul, Paul received, what, 40 lashes five times? 39, five times? Um, 
oh, but we're not supposed to go through any of that. Yeah. We need to be tame. We need to be calm. We need to calm down. Right. The world's on fire and going to hell, but we need to be silent and calm and just ride on our little merry way. Forget it. <laughs> I mean, I don't understand the church. What, what are they talking about? Yeah. The world's literally going to hell and they're talking about let's have a potluck and a pizza party. Yeah. Or they're fellowship. talking about the, the Seahawks. Or the Seahawks. Or they're talking about what? Folks, we... <laughs> it's one of dire... I've, I've, I'm worked up. Yeah. We're going to cry out while we still got breath in our lungs. Amen. I mean, if a man's in a burning car flipped upside down on the freeway, he said, well, sir, we'll get to you next Sunday at 9 a.m. prayer meeting. We'll get you out of there. You know, we'll pray you out. You're going to go and rip the door off of that car to get that man out. We need to get yeah. fired up as a church, as a fellowship, as a nation. My people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways, their wicked, evil ways. I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. This land is broken right now. It needs to be healed. Mm -hmm. And if you if you're not watching the news and if you're hid away of some corner somewhere and this is all you ever watch and you haven't heard about what's happening in Seattle right now, it's really every man for himself. Uh, there are no police. There's no law enforcement. Um, there are no EMT. Uh, there's no medics. There's no doctors. There's no so, uh, social services. Um, everyone basically fends for themselves inside of Chop Chaz. Um, they had a man last night that was killed and while he was bleeding to death, the EMTs wouldn't actually go in and get him. He actually bled to death. Wow. Because there was no services to rescue him. Now, if you don't see that as a problem, then you're just blind. You're, you're completely ignorant. People want to cut themselves off. They want to be separate from all social services. They don't want the police. They don't want fire, EMT. And this is what's going to happen. This is what happens. A man died because he could not get medical attention that he needed. He had a gunshot wound and he bled to death. And so this is, um, this is a problem that, uh, is not going to be fixed except through prayer and, and, and seeking the face of God and the church really getting a holy anger for what's happening there. Um, mm -hmm. The church is just not upset enough at what's happened. They're, they're, they're holding hands with these people. Mm -hmm. That's what infuriates me is the church groups that are in there holding their hands and waving their, uh, their, their homosexual flags and, the BLM signs, but they're not confronting the issue. They're not confronting what's happened. And so I'm very upset. I'm upset about what's happened. I'm not going to hide it. Yeah. Amen. I'm going to stand up and cry mightily against it. Mm -hmm. What were some of the things you saw there, brother? Um, well, I mean, just like you were talking about earlier, People just confused. I mean, they don't, they don't know what their end goal is. Like they don't know, they don't really know what they want. They're just, yeah. um, they're just a bunch of lawless people that, that, um, you know, they don't, they want to defund the police and, uh, they don't want any law and order, but it's going to end up just being a disaster like it already is. Well, you know, and another thing I wanted to point out was that um, this might surprise you because you might think that I'm of a different opinion than this. Like, I'm just totally against these people, and I think these people are the filth of the earth or something. I don't think that at all. Mm -hmm. My original uh, view of these people when I came in was actually, at first, I was actually surprised when I came into chap chess, I thought it was going to be like some, something out of, you know, some military war zone. You're going to go into this place and it's going to be like all these people that are zombies or something. They're just heartless people. 
that you know eat human flesh or something something out of liberia or something you know child soldiers or something i mean that's not what this is at all these people are actually deceived they're mm-hmm. deceived by the liberal ideology that they've grown up with in the public schools they're deceived by the socialism by this george soros funded movement um, mm-hmm. they're deceived by this antifa leadership and they're thinking they can build these utopian societies where everything's basically free you don't have to really work everything's provided for you can grow your own food right out of the ground so they're just they're, they're tearing up the ball fields and they're mm-hmm. you know putting their farms down and these people are just they're they're misguided and they're deceived but deep down like for example when i got pepper sprayed yesterday a man came up and pepper sprayed me in the face for preaching the word right there in chaz you know there were a, a group of people that came they weren't real really medical professionals or anything they're kind of wannabes these people are wannabes they didn't make it through medical school they didn't make it to be an emt they're not really they never became police officers now but they've been the security guard for a few years so now they're the cop and this guy didn't make it through his school training but he's now the medical professional of chaz you know it's like these people are they they want to be something that they're not they're trying to project that and so you have these people that are medical professionals quote unquote that are helping me they're putting the stuff in my eyes to get the pepper out and you know they're trying to they're trying to help me even though they disagree with me so mm-hmm. i mean i saw that the heart of the people some of these people deep down there's a real heart for wanting to help people but this is not the way to do it it's the problem mm-hmm. this is not the way it's done it's done through order law and order through discipline because there's a lack of discipline see they want the fruits but they don't want the work that goes into it they think everything should just be free. They want the socialism society, but it, no socialist society ultimately works. It collapses. Yeah. We've seen that all over the globe. I mean, look what happened to the Soviet Union. If it was such a good system, it'd be around today. But it's not a good system because socialism ultimately becomes authoritarianism. And you see that in mm-hmm. places like North Korea is a perfect example where basically the, the government becomes God because it provides all the services. So now God is pushed out of the whole picture. So people want to build a life without God. They want to build a life without God. And what happens is in the end is moral decay and corruption and chaos ensues because without law and order, there's going to be chaos. And that's what we saw all over chess. If a man disagreed with your message, guess what? They came over and and tackled us or shut us up or took our equipment or shut us down. If some reporter said something they disagreed with, they just hog tied them and pulled them out. Hmm. So there is no freedom of expression. It's censorship. That's Mm -hmm. what's happening in China right now. So, I mean, look, folks, if you want to go back to China, you can go back to China, but we're not China. We're the United States. Mm -hmm. land of the free home of the brave we can speak we got a voice so this is this this chaz is not the united states it's not a model of our country so that's what i saw that's what i saw um you know people have made a lot about the guns oh the people have got guns they've got lots of guns well you know yeah people got guns you know a lot of people in in a lot of southern states carry guns and guns are big in the south i'm a big proponent of the second amendment i've got no problem with people carrying guns okay but a lot of these people probably don't have very much weapons training okay Mm -hmm. and they're carrying around ar-15 rifles they're not using gun safety um they're not police trained they're not military trained um and so i mean they're, they're and there's little restraint and discipline I mean, you don't give a child, a five-year-old, an AK-47. You, mm-hmm. don't give an, you don't give a 15-year-old an AK-47. I'll just go, you know, use this. There's got to be discipline. There's got to be order 
in it. So I'm not really against the guns. I just want people to use them the right way and to have the restraint and discipline to use them properly. Mm -hmm. It's just a tool. But anyway, these are things that we're seeing um, in, in this society called Chaz. Yeah, and just to add to that about the, you know, people being unsafe with guns, um, there was a video that the supposed, you know, warlord of Chaz, uh, Raz, Rad. yeah, that he's a, a rapper that's, you know, trying to become rich and famous. And uh, he, he posted a, a video, you know, you can find it on YouTube, uh, of him passing out AR-15s out of his yeah. trunk and giving them to, to minors, which yeah. is a, a federal, you know, felony. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it, but this is what tell, happens. Yeah. And you can tell when he, you know, when he hands the, the rifles to minors that they've never even handled the rifle before. They have no clue how to handle it. They don't know. They don't even know where the safety's at on the thing. Yeah, exactly. I mean... <laughs> They don't even know how to put the thing on safe. They don't know if, if the round is chambered or not. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are things that if you never handled an AR-15, it's good to know. Yeah. You don't, like, for example, you don't walk around with a round chambered. Mm -hmm. I mean, you almost never do that, especially in peacetime or in a security situation. People don't know that. They'll just chamber around. They'll walk around with a chambered round, you know, mm -hmm. the thing on, on fire, ready to go. Well, what happens when you bump that trigger? I mean, these are just disasters waiting to happen. I'm just saying, especially when you're handing out these kinds of weapons, this kind of firepower to minors, it's mm -hmm. a big concern. So I'm not against the guns. I want them to be used properly. Um, but like it says, people want to be cops. They hate the cops. They hate the law enforcement. But it's, it's, it's ironic to me. It that they is. Kick all, that they kick all the cops out. And then everybody wants to play cop. I mean, imagine that. They kick all the cops out, and then you got people that want to play cop. They want to have the batons, the pepper spray, use it on who they want. We have a rifle. You know, only certain people can have the rifle. I mean, so it's just like, get rid of the police, but then we're going to become the police. Yeah. So it's all irony. It's just like, Oh, get rid of these barriers. Get rid of these barriers. They used to, they, and, and get rid of your riot gear. We don't um, take off your riot gear. We don't see no riot here. Take off your riot gear. Yeah, but then when they leave, then they throw on their vests and they put on their helmets. And it's like all the irony. And then, you know, let's get rid of all the barricades around the third precinct here on, on, on 11th. And then Right when they move out, let's throw in our, our barricades. <laughs> no, let's put up our barricades. Let's stop all. Let's, let's start putting up checkpoints. You know, look, we don't even look. Everyone's against checkpoints. Another thing that, uh, that I'd like to bring up, too, is um, last week on Saturday, when, when you and I were there preaching the gospel, and also uh, Brother David, um, yeah. You know, the, the videos and the pictures of you being persecuted went viral, you know, of them putting you in chokeholds. And it just, it totally uh, made this whole Black Lives Matter movement just look completely um, hypocritical because they ended up doing basically the same thing to you as, uh, you know, what happened to George Floyd, you know, saying I can't breathe. I can't breathe. And, and, uh, there was one point when, when you were being choked by a, by a black man, um, from behind, you know, a rear naked choke, just having the, the crap choked out of you. And you were saying, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Yeah. You know, I, I wanted to point out the, the hypocrisy there when that was happening. To oh, them. absolute hypocrisy. You know, I'm actually not, I'm not coming down hard on BLM. I don't agree with it. They have, mm -hmm. they have some points that they've brought up that need to be addressed. Uh, the police brutalities, I mean, it's without a doubt, there's an issue there. I don't know if it's necessarily systemic. I yeah. think it's just, you know, a few racists intermingled within the departments. 
I don't think it's a real deep problem. I think it's a, f a couple bad actors in there. Um, so I'm not going to come hard on BLM. I will come down hard on Antifa, though, because I think Antifa is the one that's really hijacked this. They're bringing up some good points. You had that Luis Marquez coming down, coming up from Portland. Um, he's instigating a lot of this. He's the leadership of the Portland Antifa. He was the guy that actually had me in that arm bar. Oh. And, uh, was, and was putting what happened in that video. A lot of people did not see it. They said, well, it didn't look like he was choking you. What was happening was he was putting his forearm into my neck. A lot of people cannot see that in the video. He had his forearm up and in, up into my neck. Okay. And was pushing up against it and didn't want people to see it. And that's why I cried out, you're choking me. Okay. So a lot of people, he's, he, these people are very deceptive. They know how to hide from the cameras. They try to get, you know, past the cameras. They don't want people to see what they're doing. That's why they, they told everybody, don't film. Nobody film. Turn your cameras off. The other day I saw one of the guys, they grabbed the, the phone right out of his hand and they stomped it on the ground, just crushed his phone, smashed it. Because they said, we don't want anybody filming in here. No one's going to film. Because look, they, they want to hide their sins. They're trying to hide their sins like Sodom. But it's not going to work. You're not going to hide it. It's going to get out. Mm -hmm. You can only hide for so long. Be sure your sin will find you out. I mean, there's a spiritual undertone there that I'm bringing out. But folks, I, this is a message. I mean, to these people these of Antifa. It's this is this is not gonna work. This is not gonna work, but here the thing it is, they think it will. And they're gathering followers. And this thing has it has grown. And it's something to be concerned about. And if we sit by and, and act like it's not a big deal, we're kidding ourselves. Mm -hmm. It is a big deal. They don't want any government, they don't want any police. A cab, all cops are bad. Actually, B is something else, but I'm not going to say it on here. Mm -hmm. all, all cops are bad. What I found ironic was, is when I'm in there preaching the word to them, you know what they're saying? Somebody get the police. Somebody get the police. We want to get the police and get them out of here. Remember I'm saying that? Yeah. Well, somebody get the police and get this guy out of here. Well, somebody get the police and shut this guy up. That, that, that made me laugh. Mm -hmm. You don't want the police until you want to get rid of somebody you don't like. <laughs> yeah. And that disagrees with you. And now you want the police to come in like the Gestapo and haul you away. Mm -hmm. The whole thing, brother, it, it, the whole system is flawed to the core. Mm -hmm. it, it almost makes me laugh if it wasn't a serious thing that's happening in our society. I don't want to laugh at people's calamity. I think that that's reserved for God. God laughs at their calamity. I don't want to laugh at their calamity. I feel broken for them. I'm mm -hmm. hurting for them. I want to help them. The only way to help them is to go in under the anointing of the Holy Spirit and preach the cross. That's the only thing. Is to yeah. go under the anointing of the Spirit and preach the cross to their souls. That mm -hmm. they might repent. That's their only hope. And that's the thing is when you look at revival history, like we were talking about earlier, that's the, the only thing that changes society for the better um, is when revival comes and when massive amounts of people give their lives to the Lord and repent and get saved, because that's the only thing that will change people's hearts. And you, you see, um, in in history whenever there was big revivals and lots of people got saved it changed the very fabric of society you know the economy, the economy would get better because people would the bars better. would close the nightclubs would close exactly the whole moral climate changed mm -hmm. that's, that's a real only, revival yeah it's the only solution a, re a real revival sin goes out of business mm -hmm. we're not seeing that yet no. But in a real revival, people have a deep conviction of sin. A deep conviction of sin. And that's, that can only come through the Holy Spirit. 
Man cannot bring that conviction. I'm not going to be able to bring the conviction to those people. But under the anointing of the Spirit, God can use me as a vessel, use you as a vessel, use David as a vessel, use Max, use Ryan if he comes with us, you know, to cry out to these people, God can use us as a vessel. He's not looking for better machinery. He's looking for men mm -hmm. who will stand in the gap, make up the hedge. What did he say there in uh, Ezekiel 22, 30? He said, I looked for a man. I sought for a man mm -hmm. who would stand in the gap, make up the hedge. But I couldn't find one. And God's looking in this day for people that are going to stand up and, and go and speak unto the people. Like he said to, Pete, to, to Peter and John and the, and the apostles, he said, go and stand and speak in the temple all the words of this life. Mm -hmm. And if we don't get people like that, we're not going to see the changes because he's looking for men right now yeah, and women. I'm not, I'm not being sexist, I'm looking for women too. We have different views on, on, on maybe what women are, how they're involved in the ministry, but, and I, I just want people to cry out. And, and the thing of it is too, is according to the Bible, um, you know, everyone, every believer is commanded to share their faith and to yeah. share the gospel. You know, maybe not everyone is a, uh, has the ability to be an open air preacher, but everybody should be sharing their faith in some capacity. You know, you see that in uh, Acts uh, chapter eight, after the stoning of Stephen, all the believers were scattered abroad, except for the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. But it says that all the believers, after they were scattered, they went everywhere preaching the word. Yeah. And, and the Greek word there is- um, Everywhere, brother? Wait a second, even in Chaz? Even in CHOP, even in Capitol Hill, even in the dangerous areas. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. everywhere. Everywhere. Mm -hmm. There's no place off limits for the Holy Spirit. I no. don't care what people say. I was, I was looking, sorry to interrupt you. I was looking at this video. They just put it out on Twitter. They've got a blacks only zone. Oh, man. Now, inside of uh, Chaz Chop, they, uh, they have certain hours where only blacks are allowed in a certain area mm -hmm. um, in, in, of that Cal Anderson ball field. I mean, I looked at that and I said, oh, I wish I was there right now. I would walk right into the middle of that thing <laughs> and cry oh. out. You're, yeah, not gonna tell, you're not going to tell the Holy Spirit where he's allowed to go. Mm -hmm. You're not going to have a black only field, a white only field. You know, you know what? The, the, here's the thing that made me so upset about it. the people that were telling the people this were all white people. Hmm. So the black people have now they've totally blinded some of a lot of the white people into, into believing the segregation mentality. That's what's so upsetting is that people have been so deceived by this. Black Lives Matter is not a, it's not a black group anymore. It's mostly white now. And it's become, and, and it, it, the whole phrase itself, I think is, is wrong. Mm -hmm. I, I like the phrase eternal life matters. In fact, I just, I just ordered that sign. I think Kerrigan Skelly put that out. I downloaded mm -hmm. it on Facebook. I'm gonna make a sign, eternal life matters. Mm -hmm. That's the most important thing. <laughs> yeah. But, we don't need to be, go back to segregation. That's not mm -hmm. going to fix this. And I don't know where they're getting that. That is not in the Bible. God has made of one blood all nations to dwell on the face of the whole earth. Yeah. God doesn't see race. He sees souls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just like uh, Martin Luther King Jr. said, you know, he said, I have a dream that one day people will be judged by the, not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. character. Learned that when I was in second grade. Still rings true today. But uh, I, w I wanted to get back to uh, talking about the church being lukewarm. Yeah. Uh, Jesus said in Luke uh, 14, um, verse 34, he said, Salt is good, but if the salt has lost his savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. So he's saying there, you know, the, the church becomes lukewarm and is no longer salty 
meaning, you know, salt is a, a preservative. So, you know, flavoring too. Yeah, flavoring. So if Christians are really involved and in influencing this world for the for the for the better, then we're salt. You know, we're we're preserving society yeah. from decaying and plunging into absolute chaos and moral depravity. Yeah. Um, but if we're not doing that, if we're not being the salt of the earth because we're just sitting in church and we're not on fire for God, then it says Jesus is saying. Um, we're so worthless that we're not even fit to be thrown in the manure pile. No. See, we're under going to be under greater condemnation. Mm -hmm. This this is something that might scare some people listening, but I mean, if you're a lukewarm Christian, you are going to be under greater judgment than these Antifa, these godless, these atheists. You are going to be under a greater condemnation because of your lack of of devotion you know, your lack of love in this last days um hopefully that motivates you and wakes you up because it wakes me up when i think about it that judgment must begin at the house of god and james said in james 4 it said be not many masters knowing you shall be under the greater condemnation and to him that knew his master's will and did not do it he was beaten with many stripes so the church needs to wake up because they're going to be punished far more severe mm -hmm. than these Antifa and these, these, these anarchists, these, these God haters, many of them, not all of them, but a lot of them, you know, another problem to code, I'm going to point out, and this is something Raven Hill used to always say that I've just thought about and meditated on is that the church, the, the world could never live with the church with the first century church. They couldn't live with them. Mm -hmm. They had to get rid of them. They, were, they, they had to feed them to lions. They could not tolerate the first century church. Mm -hmm. See, right now the world is, is no problem living with the church because the church doesn't, doesn't convict them. Their life doesn't convict them. Their ministries don't convict them. Their holiness doesn't convict them. But you see, men of the first century, they gave themselves to Christ and lived holy and lived righteously and walked in, in walked the world in white. They lived such holy, reverent, righteous, pure lives, and they rebuked with all authority. The church had to get rid of them. Or, the, I mean, the world had to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. They had to burn them at the stake. They had to feed them to lions. They had to get rid of them. They could not live with them. The problem is the world can live with us because we're not really doing what God has called us to do. Yeah. And the, the reason that that's happened, that we've gotten to this point, is because, as one preacher said, um, Keith Daniel, he said, uh, you know, when you try to be like the world, to win the world, the only thing that ends up happening is the world wins you. So we've, we've become too much like the world inside of the church to try to make the world feel comfortable coming into the church in order to try to get them saved. But as uh, Leonard Ravenhill said, you know, he said, um, we have become all things to all men and by all means we have saved none. So because we've, <laughs> we've had this approach that's just trying to make everyone feel comfortable, it's made the gospel completely ineffective to where almost nobody gets truly saved because there's no conviction there's no mm -hmm. there's no rebuke it's all just a feel good jesus loves you message those are the three poisons of the church comfort comfort and comfort that's it you want to spell it out it's comfort people are too comfortable they're too comfortable in their life they're too com comfortable in their ministries they're too comfortable with their success they're too comfortable with the money they're making. They're too comfortable in their families. They're just too comfortable. Okay, and that's why people don't preach because it's not comfortable to preach. I don't care what people say. It is not comfortable to open air preach. There's nothing comfortable about it because you don't rely on the flesh. There's no comfort in it. It's tiring. 
It's um, taxing on your body. Um, people come against you. People try to hurt you. People criticize you. It's not the contradiction of sinners. It's the criticism of saints. That's what hurts. Mm -hmm. And you get that more than you get the contradiction of sinners. Mm -hmm. But there's absolutely nothing comfortable about declaring the word of God. Except the comfort of the scriptures and the Holy Spirit. That's all. You don't get yeah. the comfort of the flesh. It requires a crucifixion to take place. Or you're not going to do it. And that's why there's a genuine genuineness in the open air ministry, brother, that's not like any ministry. There's a genuineness in it. Because you cannot declare to men that they need Christ in, the, in an open air ministry. You cannot do it with the passion, with the desire to do it, and you'd be living in hypocrisy because you won't last. No. You will not last. You will burn out quickly because you cannot live under that level of crucifixion and not be sincere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you are living in secret sin as an open air preacher, you're not going to last because you're not going to want to do it. Yeah. You're not going to want to do it. You're going to stop doing it. Because it's not like preaching in a church where everybody knows you. Hey, Jim, how you doing? Hey, Bob, what's going on, Sue? Hey, let's sit on, sit on down here and have a little Bible study together and talk about the word and we'll preach a Sunday message and everyone's happy on the way out. And, or maybe you live in a Holy Ghost filled, fired up pulpit church and you preach to people, you know, mm -hmm. and maybe they, but it's not like preaching to a bunch of lost atheists that hate God that want to mm -hmm. come after you with torches and pitchforks. <laughs> it's, you're not going to do it, brother. Mm -hmm. I don't care what anyone says. You're not well, going to last as an open air preacher living in sin. Uh, that's another another thing that I wanted to talk about. That's really frustrating as an open air preacher is that um, going to church. Um, you know, you get criticized by your pastor. You know, and other people telling you that you're doing it wrong. And uh, uh, you know, not only that, but also uh, something that's very troubling is that. When you try to get other people in the church to come out and and share the word with you, you know, even even though you're not asking people to do exactly the same thing that you do, an open air preach, you know, you're just trying to get more people out there with you so you can have um, people out helping to pass out more tracks or hold more signs or you know just talk to people, which anybody can do that. I anybody mean, anybody can do that. It, that's not hard to do at all. No. Especially when you're in a group and you're not out there by yourself. And yet, you know, trying to find believers that will come out and do that with you is really rare. It's really hard. Yeah. Um, and that's really disappointing. And that's really sad that hardly anyone wants to get out and preach the gospel. Well, another thing is to understand is that God has equipped a preacher for one purpose, and that is to preach. So if a preacher does not preach, Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. God has equipped you for one purpose and one mission. If you are truly called, you will be a failure at everything you try. Everything. You will be a failure because God has not equipped you for that. He's equipped you for one thing. One thing is to preach the gospel. So you can't even tell a preacher, a God called minister, a man of God is called to preach. You can't even tell him to just go pass out tracks because mm. he's not called to just pass out tracks. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's something for the, the layman to do. That's something for the church to pass out tracks. I mean, obviously a God called man, I hand out tracks all the time. I have a bunch of them, but that's not even my calling. God's equipped me for one thing. And that is to declare the glory of God to the lost. That's it. Mm -hmm. And someday I'll be full time in that. I'm not there yet. But by the grace of God, he will lead me in that because that's the only thing he's equipped me for. Hmm. And, and when, true, when a true man of God will understand that, a true God called minister who's been called by God 
when I would like I was when I was 21 to declare the lost because I got a vision of the lost. Hmm. When a man died in my military unit, God gave me a vision of a, a lost man in hell. Wow. And I still remember it to this day, brother. It was so terrifying. I don't even want to think about it even. It gives me nightmares. That's crazy. And so from that day forward, I was called to go and declare. Now, I didn't actually start open air preaching until a few years, three years ago. God had to give me that meeting to meet Jesse Morrell and get into the street ministry. But And then Adam LaCroix helped me down in Florida. But look, God has, has been equipping me since I submitted to him three years ago to do this. And he's only equipped me for one thing. Amen. So. Um, and something that I just thought of is uh, another thing Leonard Ravenhill said is he said that uh, he has a hard time believing, uh, or he, he said he doesn't believe that most pastors and most Christians uh, truly even believe that there is such a thing as hell, even though most of them say they do believe in hell. Because if they truly did believe that every person that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior is going to perish forever, they would be out preaching the gospel if they truly believe that. Yeah, it's, it's a practical, it, it, they, they practically don't believe it. They believe mm -hmm. it in, in theory. Yeah. Hell is a theory. It's on paper. Yeah, there's eternal punishment. It's in our doctrinal statement, but we don't really live like there's a hell. Exactly. And I, and I would say this. I'm gonna just going to say it. I don't think any of us live enough like there's a hell. I think if we'd all search our lives, open air preachers, me, you, all of us, we could all search ourselves and say, you know, do we really believe in hell the way that the Bible describes it? Mm -hmm. Do I really believe that if that individual died right now, they would go to a Christless eternity and burn and burn forever and ever and ever and ever? And do I live that way? So, I mean, if we'd all search ourselves, there's going to be areas that we can improve on. But I think the more we spend time in prayer, God's going to begin to reveal unto us the severity, the goodness in the severity of God. Because mm -hmm. I'm tired of these churches going out to this Chaz Chop zone. There's a couple of church leaders I've met out there, in there, talking to people and just handing out Bible pens with rainbows on them or whatever. What? Well, yeah, I mean, it's just all kinds of stuff. Churches, they're handing out stuff. But that's not going to change the world any more than melt. You, you, then you're going to melt an iceberg with a match. You know, we got to get back to the, the fundamental principles, the cross, mm -hmm. the crucified life, putting to death the deeds of the body. Yeah. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. See, nobody wants to look at that. Oh, you mean I got to mortify my internet history? I got to mortify my, my internet searches? I've gotta order, I got to mortify my, my sexual practices? I've got to mortify my, yeah. You got to mortify it. You got to put it to death. Well, I can't do that. You're right. You can't. That's why you better get on your knees and, and ask God mm -hmm. to make you born again so that you can become a new creature so that you can. Because if you don't, you're going to go to hell because the Bible does not lie. And no fornicator nor idolater or adulterer nor effeminate nor abuser of themselves with mankind a drunkard, and none of those people are going to the kingdom. Mm -hmm. So either God lied or you need to get saved. And I think it's the latter. Yep. Well, brother, um, I think we should uh, wrap this up. We covered a lot. Um, yeah, I mean, this, you know, the whole topic of this was what's going on in Seattle what's going on in the churches, um, what's the fabric of society looking like, especially up here 
in the Northwest, which is not good. Um, we're going to see where this goes. Um, I'm going to encourage, I'm going to put this out. I'm going to encourage any local preacher, local pastor, local Christian, local believer. I mean, if, if, if you've got any ounce of zeal in you to come and meet us at this autonomous zone, Forget about the fear, forget about the lions, forget about the danger, forget about it all. And come cry mightily. Because I think in the darkest places, the light of Christ shines the brightest. Now you've used a flashlight out in the middle of the day. What, what good does it do? Not good at all. You take a flashlight into a dark cave, you're gonna see something. So I guarantee you this, if you come out, you're going to see something. You're going to see hearts touched. You're going to see hearts touched. I promise you that. Amen. So yeah, praise God. Amen. Thanks for having me on. It was my pleasure. It's a blessing for sure. So uh, thanks for coming on the show with me. Um, yeah. And if anybody out there wants a hat, they can also reach out and we can give them these hats. We don't charge people for hats. We want you to wear these hats. Um, just contact Dakota, let him know how many you need. He can get a, he can get a hold of me. Um, we want people to wear these. Look, I wear this thing, basically a hat like this everywhere I go. Grocery stores, gas stations, wherever I'm at. People say, oh man, nice hat. You say, yeah, do you know the Lord? The Lord's coming. You know, it's, just, it's a good ministry opportunity because you can be soul winning everywhere you go with your hat. So I tell people that, hey, maybe you don't have a track on you, but hey, you got a hat. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's all they need to see is just that reminder that Jesus is there. Oh man, look, tell me about Jesus. What do you know about Jesus? So... Amen. All right. Well, thanks for uh, watching the video and uh, God bless. Yeah. Praise God, brother. God bless.